Okay. Um, maybe we should start. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll introduce myself. Um, those of you who don't know me, I'm Bob Cars, class of 67, and I'm uh, the vice president of programs for the MIT club. And uh, I've been running or, or, or organizing, I should say, most of these <laughs> webinars. Uh, you get a lot of uh, messages from me. These webinars are jointly conducted with a club of Western New York. They put on some and then we put on some. Uh, uh, the last couple have been us, but they will be getting back, back into it. Um, uh, we try and invite everybody to each other's events. And um, this is another one, as I mentioned earlier, if anybody's been on. Uh, first is the ground rules. And that is that I ask everybody to uh, mute their uh, mics uh, in general, and then unmute them if you want to ask the question. Rather than having people asking questions uh, um, uh, right through the right through, I'm asking people to ask their questions via chat. Uh, put it in chat. I will see it. And uh, what we're going to do is wait for a convenient time, convenient break uh, for John Randall, and uh, I'll read the questions off. Or actually, before I read the questions off, I'll give each person who's asking the question a chance to unmute and ask the question himself. If not, I will read it. So please put your questions via chat. And questions are encouraged, are encouraged during this thing, uh, but we're going to try and uh, plan it so that it doesn't interrupt the flow of the presentation. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. A very This is turning out to be a very popular event. This is one of the best turnouts uh, uh, we've had. Uh, it's going to be uh, John Randall, who's a class of 74, electrical engineering. Uh, John's been working and has worked in his career on software development and management in telecom, biotechnology, uh, risk man and risk management uh, industries. And uh, he retired in uh, 2021. Uh, he's a climate refugee, end quote, from uh, <laughs> California, where the uh, drought and fires, I think, uh, finally got to him. So he came back to Rochester, where there's snow. Uh, <laughs> at any rate, uh, uh, it's, we're happy to have him over here. And, and since uh, he retired in 2021, he's become very active in climate change. Uh, I mentioned briefly that Jeremy Grace, who's also on here, is also active from our area in the Climate Change Initiative at MIT. Uh, if you haven't been involved in it and want to find out about it, I suggest you uh, check. I think you'll, you'll see some references to them uh, from uh, either John or uh, Jeremy. At any rate, with that, I'm going to turn it over to John for his presentation. And again, I'll look for the uh, questions in chat. I see I've got several comments now. Uh, no, we're okay. So uh, uh, John, it's all yours. Okay, thanks Bob. Thanks, Bob. Um, I hear myself. Okay, good, it stopped. Um, thanks, good. thanks everybody for showing up. This is, uh, this is so, so good. Um, so let me just uh, dive right in if my keyboard will respond. Okay, there we go. So I wanted to share just a little bit, uh, a, a few more details about my, uh, my personal journey over the last two years. So uh, I was living in Northern California. We moved out as uh, part of an acquisition in 1997. And we noticed that over the last 10 years, it was getting noticeably hotter and drier each year. And then this is September 16th, 2020. So this is a wonderful app, windy.com, if you're not familiar with it. Um, they do a beautiful job of presenting publicly available weather data, weather related data. And this is one of the overlays you can put on the map. This is 2.5 micron particulate matter pollution. And you can see the extent of this. It's all the way up. Um, California through Idaho. And, uh, and the smoke is bad enough, it reaches across the continent. And this is where I said, you know, this is, this is a big problem. And, um, and it, you know, everybody has different uh, things they'd rather avoid. And this is, I, I was looking at pictures of, you know, homes that were burned down. And I said, I never want to experience that. I'd rather have snow personally. So, <laughs> So, um, so let's let's just briefly uh, look at. So, um, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. So, uh, what I did after retiring, well, the first thing was um, I started looking around for how to get more involved with the climate, and I found the Climate Reality Project, which is Al Gore's project, um, and went through their training to become a uh, climate reality leader, which basically uh, kind of authorizes you to give presentations and use you know, their name. When you approach people about giving a presentation, you can say, this is Al Gore's you know, material. Um, and in the course of that, I found this. 
So I wanna spend just a minute here. Um, so this is, this is from the IPCC, this diagram. Um, so you can see, obviously, the business as usual scenario with the uh, increasing uh, emissions. Um, and then the below two degrees centigrade, which um, I think isn't aggressive enough um, personally, but whatever, for purposes of illustration. Uh, what it shows you starting from the left is that uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases. So this is methane, um, nitrous oxides, and the fluorocarbons. Um, which are much, much more effective at trapping uh, emissions than CO2 is. So even though they represent a significantly smaller fraction, they still have uh, quite a large impact in terms of warming. Um, these numbers are typically presented as CO2E, meaning equivalent, which is what this graph is. So the, um, the, 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 the area taken by the other GHG um, is how much CO2 would it take to have an equivalent warming effect? So you can see as we drop emissions, it all drops, but in order to keep below two degrees C, we need to hit net zero in 2090. And you can see that if we don't take CO2 out of the air, there's no way to do that. And once I could see this, I said, okay, this is really interesting. I wanna see, you know, how, how can this be done? And so I signed up for something called um, the Air Miners Boot Up. I found this uh, organization. It was a five week uh, interactive training twice a week. Um, they'd give you a list of reading materials and then you'd meet with your, a team and you'd discuss, you'd kind of cross fertilize. You'd, you'd, just, you'd all talk about which of the articles, because there were always more than any one person would do, but you know we picked them at random. And so we'd, we'd each have things to share with the rest. Um, <clears throat> and so out of that, I, I, I continued um, then to get um, to research it. Uh, and so here's, um, let's see. Oh, yeah, this one, <clears throat> you see, as I mentioned, I think two degrees C, um, when you consider that we're at 1.1, and we're already seeing the tipping points, you know, the permafrost melting, uh, changes in ocean currents, um, Arctic wildfires. We're already seeing these things at 1.1. So I, I don't really see how, you know, we can even think of two as a target. Um, so I, I wanted to get this graph. And basically, uh, and this is again from the IPC, IPCC. Um, and the difference here is that uh, net zero needs to occur around 2050 or 2060. So 30 years sooner, which obviously is very, very, it's going to be a tremendous challenge to do that. Um, but so, <clears throat> yeah, so let's, let's look at um, Earth's carbon cycles as kind of a, a starting point. So um, this diagram, um, has so in the parentheses is the natural it's a it's a natural reservoir and this is the amount that's typically there um, the the flows are what changes um, the red ones are what we've contributed I think this is a little out of date but it's still um, really what I wanted to show was all of the different carbon cycles that we're aware of and also the, the volume that we're talking about, just how much carbon naturally cycles uh, through the environment. Because these, these numbers are all gigatons per year. So huge amount of carbon. Um, you can see the soil sequesters a huge amount. And the deep ocean is the champion, 37,000 gigatons of carbon. Um, it's, and and we'll, uh, we'll look at uh, several approaches to, uh, you know, trying to, um, you know, tap that store. Because if, if you think, uh, we know, we need to get rid of 10, well, percentage-wise, that's just a rounding error on this. So if there were some way to, you know, get the ocean to absorb more, you would think it, it would have a negligible effect. Okay, so the approaches to capture and sequestration, um, I think those two words are clear, but I just, just to take a second. So capture is, is uh, chemically removing carbon 
from the atmosphere and sequestration is putting it somewhere where it won't escape for at least a century. Uh, <clears throat> so here are several uh, going from left to right, coastal blue carbon. This is um, mostly marine, so mangroves, uh, sea grasses, so uh, plants uh, and, and plant environments that naturally sequester a lot of carbon, a lot more than um, say forests, than land um, because of their deep root systems. Now, if we look at ocean chemistry, so this accelerated chemical weathering of rocks. So this is um, looking at the, the basic equation for what happens to CO2 when it gets into the water. It's turning it acidic. Um, if you can accelerate the natural movement of limestone, which is basic, into the oceans, you can neutralize the carbon that's there. And some people are looking into, okay, how much limestone would that be? And, uh, you know, how disruptive would it be to the ocean ecosystem if you dumped a whole bunch in there at once? And, you know, all that sort of thing. But it's, it's uh -huh. a possible approach. Um, so next, direct air capture. Oh, next, direct air. So this is, uh, you know, this, this is typical of, um, you know, Climeworks. This is a Climeworks machine. Um, so you, you, you try to pull CO2 directly out of the atmosphere by circulating air over some sort of, um, you know, absorbing medium. And then um, once, it's, once it's captured, then you release it from the whatever it is that you're using to capture it. Um, and you can either put it through some sort of uh, just directly into a geological formation as supercritical or gaseous CO2, um, or you can put it through some sort of mineralization process and it can become stable that way. So the next one, biomass energy with carbon capture and storage. So this was, uh, people were really excited about the idea of, of thinking that you could, um, and uh, you probably remember all, you know, looking at, okay, what kind of plants are going to be really good for this? What's drought tolerant? It grows quickly. And people are looking at switchgrass and um, all these various things because they were thinking that, well, photosynthesis naturally pulls CO2 out of the air. So if we could do that and then somehow process the um, cellulosic material into sin fuels, then we have a closed cycle. We're no longer pulling carbon basically out of geologic storage and putting it in the atmosphere like we do with fossil fuels. Uh, we're pulling it out of the air, burning it, putting it back in the air. So, um, I'm coming. And then the, um, the, the addition, oh, so that's, okay. it's, it's the biomass energy side of it. Um, that carbon capture well, is, I, well, of course, like, you can, you can you imagine, appreciate that it's. Okay. Uh, do you want me to recycle those? Can we get Marilyn to mute, please? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, so the, it's much easier to capture CO2. You can, you can appreciate when you do direct air capture, you're talking about 400 parts per million. Um, it's very difficult. Um, and the, if you can put the carbon capture right on the smokestack where the CO2 percentages are much higher, then it's, it's easier to capture it. And so you're thinking, well, I can burn whatever biomass or, or conceivably still fossil fuel, but capture the CO2, don't put it in the atmosphere and then sequester it. Um, so afforestation or reforestation, of course, we all know trees, I mean, they're photosynthesis machines. Um, and then the last one, soil. So let's, now, what we've learned over the past, because people have been trying to do this now in various forms for 40, 40, 30, 40 years. And what we found is these are the important attributes of carbon capture techniques. So the first is the cost. If it costs too much, you know, we can't, we, it won't happen because we can't afford it. The durability is very important. Um, and we'll get into that. But this is basically after you capture it and sequester it, how long can you guarantee that it's gonna stay there where you put it and not just escape back into the atmosphere because we are talking about a gas. And even if you put it underground as supercritical CO2, if there are any sort of geologic fissures, um, you know, it's gonna find its way out. Um, and some people um, in the industry, in the sequestration industry um, talk about one to 2% leakage rates, thinking that that's acceptable. If you need it to stay there for a century, it's not acceptable. Is over a century, it's all gotten out. Um, 
So verifiability, this is a real challenge in some of those scenarios. And of course, scale and speed. So we're talking about a huge volume um, and we need, we need the situation to change quickly. So whatever uh, approach you, know, you might wanna consider, uh, you have to kind of do a, a, almost a back of the envelope calculation of, well, can this possibly scale into the gigaton range? And can we do it over the next 10 to 20 years? Um, then there's a risk of side effects where you know, you're doing something that has a beneficial effect on terms of carbon, but then has real downside in some other way. There are justice issues. Um, the biggest one really is that um, you know, we, we Americans, North Americans are pretty much responsible for this problem. And yet we expect everybody else in the world to get on board and help pay for it. Um, but there are many, many justice issues that go along with it. And it would be um, really wonderful if we could get ourselves in, in better alignment. And biodiversity, I think probably everybody's aware that we're in uh, what some people are calling the sixth mass extinction. Um, so uh, this is, uh, and this goes hand in hand with uh, climate change because a lot of why this is happening is extinction of species is because the climate is changing faster than they can adapt. So let's look at cost versus scale. So this is, as I, as I put from IPCC 1.5. Um, so here in kind of big, big terms. So direct um, capture with, uh, the DA. Um, direct capture with store with sequestration is um, has the potential to get uh, as as you can see five gigatons per year, um, which is the kind of number that we need. Um, but as far as we can estimate, based on you know current um, you know uh, prototypes, there is actually there are two uh, commercially viable operating companies that are doing this, um, and you know based on projections of economies of scale, we still think this is going to be up in the two to $300 a gigaton range. Um, wait, no, ton, I didn't, not a gigaton. If we could do it for $300 a gigaton, we'd be all done. Um, tons, yeah, $300 a ton. Uh, okay, so now BECCS, that's um, bioenergy CCS. This is since then, this term has been retired. They now call it bikers which I'll get into because it became broader than simply bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, um, enhanced weathering. And then, uh, so biochar is, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about that when we get there. Um, you can see the afforestation and reforestation um, is lowest cost, but it's hard to see how we're gonna really get where we need to be because uh, you'd have to dedicate so much of the land surface to forest. And the dark horse here, soil carbon sequestration. I mean, look at the scale and it's the lowest cost, but it has other problems. So let's go look at that. So direct air capture. And I just put this little thing here just as a reminder. So this is the order in which I was trying to figure out how to make this kind of coherent. So we're gonna go from the most expensive to the least expensive over the course of the presentation. So <clears throat> this, this background, by the way, is called Earthrise um, from uh, NASA. It's a beautiful shot from the moon. So here's the picture of the uh, Climeworks uh, Orca system in Iceland on the lower left. And uh, so they have, you know, obviously many, many fans. They simply pull the air across some sort of capture mechanism um, and then uh, sequester it underground. The, this is in Iceland because they have access to lots and lots of geothermal energy. Uh, because one of the downsides, because this process is energy intensive, is you can, you know, spend a lot of your carbon budget just running the process. Um, which of course is very counterproductive. Um, <clears throat> it's also very expensive. You have to build these huge and maintain these huge machines. Um, and then there are the potential issues with long-term storage man management. And, um, and then there's the ongoing cost of operating it, mostly because it's so energy intensive. However, if you look at on the lower right, 
So this is from a TED talk by Jennifer Wilcox, who's, who's a specialist in this. So she made this diagram to illustrate that these machines are much more efficient than trees are. So if you see the Amazon rainforest, of course, and here is this little box in yellow, a direct air capture facility at um, 11,200 square kilometers would capture the same amount of CO2. John? Yeah. John, Andy has a question for you. Uh, Andy Kadek, uh, do you want to ask it or shall I read it out? Unmute, please. Yes, I was curious about the technology that's used for the actual capture through these fans. Okay, um, I actually, unfortunately, um, did not prepare that for the climb works. Um, I'm sorry, the, the, the next one after this, I actually talk a little about the te technology. Um, so um, I have it in the list of references at the end, um, the website, which would have more information. Yeah, John, one other quick one. Uh, yep. uh, I did, uh, uh, one of us, uh, James uh, Valencia, I think it is, wants to know, Valencia, uh, Jamie, uh, can, these slide pack can the slide package be made available after the uh, presentation? Yes, I'm okay, happy how, to do that. How should we do that? Do you want to uh, have them send you an email and you can mail it to them or how would you like to do it? Yeah, that's fine. That's okay. fine. Or I'll put that. it in a, in a Dropbox and send a link to it. I think it okay, might be too a, big to email. If you send it, send it, yeah, put it in Dropbox, send me, send, send me the link and I'll uh, post it to the uh, distribution. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Here's another um, uh, just example of a, an industrial, you know, operating facility. Um, but just to underscore the point of the scale, so you see, you look at these huge machines, you say, oh, this must be making a difference. Well, no, 0.12%. So um, we would need a lot of these machines before we could really you know, see any results. So here's the other one. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, no, this is the one in Iceland. It's actually a Swiss company, but the, the largest installation that they have uh, is the recent uh, site they call Orca in Iceland. Um, now the business model gets interesting. So they, you can go on their website and you can order some sequestered carbon if, you know, if you feel compelled to do that. And we will talk about that later. The, the, uh, the voluntary market is what that's known as. Um, they have the option of mineralizing the captured CO2, which is just a wonderful thing because that takes care of the durability problem. Okay. Okay. John, yep. one other thing. Uh, yep. uh, Howard Herzog knows how Climeworks is, uh, Climeworks is uh, extracting uh, the CO2. So uh, if you like, he can give us a brief description. Sure. Howard, unmute. I'll mute myself. Yeah. Oh, there. I, yeah. They, they, they use uh, chemical absorption. Um, well, the solvents, they keep changing a little, but basically a mean type solvents. Um, oh, okay. So, so it's a, a weak base and they regenerate it uh, with a temperature vacuum swing. So they raise the temperature to about 100 degrees C and pull a little vacuum to pull it off and then start over again. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> yeah, uh, Jennifer Wilcox, who I mentioned, um, talked a little about um, the, um, that you're fighting with thermodynamics because You've, you've got something at 400 parts per million and you're trying to capture it as you're blowing it through a system. And so whatever it is that you're using to capture it bonds really tightly to it. And so when it comes time now, you want to get the CO2 in a, in a state where you can sequester it. It takes a lot of energy to break the bond, basically. So she said, it's, you know, you're fighting an uphill battle there. Um, and this is the carbon engineering. So this is another one. Uh, this is based in Canada. And this one, they said, uh, I had a little more information about the actual process, which was different. Uh, now, they, I didn't see any information other than this reference, pilot demonstration of, quote, air to fuels technology. So, um, so we'll have to see. But you see, in terms of time frame, they're talking about having their first commercial plant design ready by around now. I don't didn't see any, any more information about how that's going. 
the reason I mention them at all is because you'll see at the very end, I have a list of companies who have both um, purchased and sold sequestered carbon, and they're on the list. They've already got customers signed up. So um, it's interesting. So here we are, the scorecard, trying to use those um, criteria that I mentioned earlier. Um, so the verifiability is wonderful with DAC because uh, you can just measure you know, how much you captured. Um, now this, this, if enough machines are operating, I mean, it has that advantage. It's horizontally scalable and it makes good use of the land. Um, it's less susceptible to climate change. That's an interesting uh, thing to add, which we will talk more about when we get to forests. Um, so the downsides, of course, cost, durability. Um, now the durability, if it's mineralized, is excellent. But if you, if you put it underground to supercritical CO2, um, it's less dense than the brine you typically find in these under, underground uh, formations, and it'll try to get out. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so yeah, this one is probably, I mean, it, well, what we don't have a good idea about yet is what happens if you start putting 10 gigatons a year of stuff under the ground? Uh, you know, it's just, it's a huge number. And, but we, we, we don't really have a lot of choice unless, um, you know, we can sequester it on the surface somehow. Um, okay, so here's, here's what was BECCS and they expanded it to include biochar and ag agriculture, biochar and sequestration, and fast pyrolysis of biomass to bio oil, which is a patented process by this one company, which I find really interesting. Um, so I've got a, a profile of them. But this all starts with basically photosynthesis, using photosynthesis to get the CO2 out of the air, and then trying to do something with the resulting cellulosic material. Um, so there's a, a, a task force for bikers. Um, and so a lot of this, you can see, I have the reference at the bottom and it's at the end. And if you get the slide deck, you'll have all the references in it. Um, but they have a very, very detailed roadmap of you know, planning and feasibility studies and then scaling. Um, so let's just go through this quickly. So the goal is to remove 10 gigatons by mid-century. Um, that's in line with the... Um, 1.5 C goal. Um, that, of course, is, I mean, the, the, the net zero by then requires that we have greatly reduced our emissions at the same time. We can't, can't think of carbon capture as the solution. It's just part of the solution. Um, so if properly developed, they right away have to put this caveat in because um, it can become, as they say in the next bullet, Dedicated energy crops can damage ecosystems, hurt local farmers, and increase emissions. So the, the, the feedstocks, the ideal feedstocks are waste biomass. So for example, corn stover. So you've harvested all your corn and now you've got all these stalks. Um, now some part of that wants to get recycled into the soil, but um, I have, uh, a, we'll get to a paper from the University of Iowa talking about this exact problem. How much of the stover can you remove without really harming the soil? Um, but so if we're gonna think about, um, you know, possible feedstocks, dedicated energy crops are certainly there. Uh, Microalgae, um, which can be grown in ponds or reactors. There's an interesting project in um, Kentucky where they're taking the, flu gases from a, I think, called cold or gas-fired power plant. And they're running them through these multiple towers, which are simply growing algae. Um, so the algae, you're pulling most of the CO2 out. And it's, a, it's an experimental thing at this point, but uh, interesting. So the, um, now the interesting thing about biomass is, is by itself, it's, um, what do they call it? Fluffy is the word I've seen used. It's not that easy to handle. It's not a fluid, you know, it's bulky. Um, so if you could convert it into some other form close to where it's produced, um, then it could become relatively easy to deal with. Um, 
so let's see. And this is now this is this is another consideration: separation of storage, co-location of large biomass supplies and geological storage resources. So you will see um, there are maps available uh, showing uh, well, around the world. Let me turn this down. Um, where the, this, the two conditions are the same, where there are suitable geologic formations for sequestration and also for growing biomass um, because they're, you know, people are trying to plan, well, where is it going to make sense to do this? Um, and interestingly, um, and we'll get, well, no, this isn't the emissions talk, sorry. Carbon, uh, concrete, it turns out, all the way back to Roman times, the fundamental reaction that is used to produce concrete releases CO2. And if you, um, what do they call it, the calcification reaction. So if you, if you look at how many tons of concrete are used in building around the world, you see it, it's actually a significant contributor to uh, CO2 emissions. And let's see. So, okay. So this is the summary from the, um, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the long-term plan for bikers. Um, so, uh, and I thought this was a really nice summary. So it's, it will scale. Several gigatons could be removed and stored underground. Um, and this, this one is, is this the where they say it? Uh, yeah, I was thinking of finding four. So finding two, energy production is not the only way that biomass can be used. Because for years, that's what we thought. We were thinking in terms of, okay, just like the fact that we have ethanol in our gasoline, we were thinking of, well, we can grow our fuel. And more and more, I mean, for myriad reasons, we're realizing that that's not really going to work. Um, so governance and accounting issues this is very interesting. Um, is there are just so many kind of hard to measure and define variables. And the finding four, I think, is really interesting. The removal value may increasingly exceed its energy value. So you wouldn't, I mean, this is following on the, um, you know, that in retrospect, we look at, at back at the decision to turn corn into ethanol and put it in our gasoline and say, you know what, it didn't even get us the benefit that we thought we were going to get from it other than expanding the corn market. So it's, um, so it's, it's I'm, I'm really glad to see that we're kind of learning from our mistakes and, and saying, and so this is the, the economic side of that, as you say, you know, because we have this big uh, CO2 problem um, causing warming, that it may make more sense to buy the carbon and sequester it, the biomass. And, Many technologies required are already mature. This is fantastic because we don't have any time. You know, we need to move quickly. Um, now, I'm going to talk about Red Plus, so we'll get to that. And then finding seven, seven of course, is the, is the warning. If we don't do it right, it, it'll probably just backfire on us. Um, so, okay. So this is um, Charm Industrial and they solve a number of the problems that um, I, I mentioned. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in this company. So, um, so they start with cellulosic biomass. Um, and it turns out because we, we had visions of creating a sin fuels based economy where we're gonna convert cellulosic biomass into fuels that we could put in our cars and, you know, so there's all this technology developed, these fast pyrolyzers, this whole technology uh, was developed with the end goal of producing sin fuels. It turns out that the chemistry is just too complicated, is you've got to have carefully controlled feedstocks to go into that process if you want to end up with something that is energy rich enough and, does not and is not already oxygenated. So you can see here in the second point, the biomass breaks down into bio oil, which is rich in carbon, but has higher oxygen, lower energy content. In other words, you can't use it as a fuel. So the fast pyrolysis process, the machines were developed and can be repurposed for this, for sequestration, even though it turned out to be very problematic to actually use them to produce sin fuels. 
So the and the third step, the bio oil is prepared and injected into industrial disposal wells. It turns out that there are many, many, this is a, a, a already well established, um, understood, regulated technology. This, uh, I need to get rid of some volume of fluid. I want to put it underground. Um, you know, the EPA already has standards for where you can do it and yeah. So, um, so this is really clever, I think, leveraging of, um, you know, technologies developed originally for a different purpose. And now we're finding ourselves that in the, in the position where, John, yeah. I have a question about this charm effect. If it's, if you got to heat everything to 500 C in order to reduce it, how much it, energy, how much energy goes into heating it? You know, how much carbon is wasted, depending on how you make, how you, so, what energy source you use, but. No, that's. Make sense? It, it's, it's an excellent question. And there, I, I didn't include that in the slide, although I'm happy to add it and, and send it in. So they calculate their whole budget, their whole carbon budget. And they use the heat from the biomass to generate the heat they need to do the pyrolysis. And they still end up ahead of the, well ahead of the game. So they, so they didn't have to, you know, burn some fossil fuels to get the bio oil. They just factor that into the whole, the whole life cycle. So um, now this graph, this was something, you know, after I saw that Charm had it, I went and looked at all of the other sites and I only found one other that had results to talk about. Um, and this is, um, as you can see, they include Climeworks on here. Um, although Climeworks doesn't, um, they don't publish it on their site, you know, how much they've actually sequestered to date. Um, but I, I, you know, they, I, I'm, I'm giving them the uh, benefit of the doubt that they, you know, the, the information is reasonably accurate. Um, but you can see that Charm has demonstrated with their, their pilots that they're able to um, scale. And the, um, the interesting thing is, um, is, is they can put these fast uh, pyrolysis machines at or very close to the biomass generation site. So you don't have to transport the biomass very far. You know, they pick it up off of the fields and dump it in the pyrolyzer. And it produces this oil, which then can be shipped in trucks or, you know, it's, um, it's not like, again, supercritical CO2, which is really, really cold. You can't, you can't just put it in an oil truck, you know, and move it. So, um, so this, is, this is interesting. Now, this is, um, I, I just recently learned of this thing called the uh, rights law. That's with a W, which is similar to Moore's law in that it's not a law at all, but it tends to be true. Um, I'm assuming everybody knows what Moore's law, I do because of my background. So Moore's law said every two years, the, the computer density and speed was going to double. And it, it's held true far longer than anybody thought. So Wright's law says if uh, this has to do with economies of scale, it says well, you're, the first time you double your production, if you saw a cost reduction of 35%, that 35% is going to hold true the next time you double and the next time you double and the next time you double. So that results in this sort of curve, which falls steeply and then, you know, asymptotically approaches zero. And at the first part of this, the voluntary carbon removal market, removal market. So that's uh, Shopify is, is the big one, um, but there's a whole list of them and, and I have them in a, in a later slide. And John? yes. Okay, there's a couple of questions. I don't know if this is a good time or whether you want to bring it up. Uh, uh, one of them is Her Her Harold uh, Clark about uh, whether microbes uh, like to eat bio oil. I think this is a good time for that one. Harold, would you like to ask it? Sure. I was just wondering if there are any microbes that uh, like bio oil. It'd be terrible to put it underground and end up feeding bugs that just turn it back into a gas. That is an excellent point. So I don't know directly the answer to that. What I do know is that when you put the bio oil underground, it turns into a solid. The, something about the ongoing reaction. Um, but that's certainly a, an interesting question. I, I'm actually, um, I want to ask Charm if they've thought about that. Also, um... 
The other question, this was a comment from a few minutes ago on the chat by uh, Jamie Valencia uh, yeah. about uh, carbon engineering and a talk to her this afternoon. Yeah. I wonder whether, uh, I'll, ask, I'll ask, ask Jamie to ask it. I'm just wondering whether you're familiar with carbon engineering. Uh, Jamie, go ahead. Uh, no, it's just that I was at a Sarah Week um, uh, conference this afternoon in combustion in, in, in um, that company, uh, carbon engineering was giving a presentation Mm -hmm. uh, with with uh, and and they were indicating at that time that they were planning on having that unit operational by 2024, the one that they were referring ah. to, and it was okay. actually in conjunction with Oxy. So uh, it it was interesting uh, just to to hear that they were planning on moving forward, but mm -hmm. it would be interesting to see whether they they are able to do it or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the machine? Were they talking about their air to fuels technology or? So the, the, key, the key point that they were making is that all of the uh, processes, mm -hmm. uh, all of the individual components, if you will, to the entire process were proven in, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. at a scale. So they were simply taking the various, the various components uh, for their process and they had borrowed them from this industry and from that industry and from the other one and, and mm -hmm. basically just stitched them together mm -hmm. uh, and, and they were hoping to have the unit operational by 2024. And it's not okay. an easy task. We'll see if they are able to pull it through. Yes. Uh, you know, certainly wish them all, all success. Um, right, right. Yeah, although, although you can see from their website where I pulled the information, their original estimate was 2022, but, um, you know, that's, that's not. Um, anyway, it was just a comment. I didn't mean to interrupt the presentation. Uh, John, go ahead. We don't have technical problems here. Hold on a second. You know what? It's, there you it's, go. You're in. it's this button. Yeah, I, I, it's like butt dialing. You know, I hit the thing inadvertently and then I'm muted. Anyway, um, so the interesting thing about the, the, the discussions when you have, so you have, you have a company, um, so they, they talked a lot about Microsoft and Microsoft has a whole group dedicated to, okay, we want to be net zero in 10 years and they're trying to figure out how to do that. Um, not by developing their own technology, but by developing the carbon removal and sequestration market. And so they see their role as um, basically, what would you say, angel investors, kind of. So they're, they want to pay less for it, but they're willing to pay more if what they're buying is cost reductions so that the market expands. So if their early investment at really a higher than acceptable price means that the supplier is going to be in a better position to reduce the price, then they're willing to do it. Um, this, of course, would be a very natural uh, role for government to play. Um, but uh, right now, we're, none of this relies on the government doing anything other than staying out of the way. Um, and so you can see the first... Um, the first thing is the voluntary carbon removal. You get it down to a price point now where, so LCSF and 45Q. So the, um, the, the government has started to try to, uh, what would you say, institutionalize or standardize um, carbon credits. And this 45Q is about um, trying to de determine or certify what is actually a valid credit because uh, a lot of companies wanting to do the right thing got caught up in buying offsets and saying, well, I, I'm still going to emit this much for now. So I'm going to buy something from somebody else that says, well, they're going to emit less and it's going to offset what I'm doing. And it turns out that an awful lot of people were getting scammed. And so the, um, the government has stepped in to try to bring some order to that. Um, and so in the course of that, we see that a lot of companies are going to want us to continue to buy offsets. And of course, if 
what they can buy is the sequestration process, then that there's, there's no scamming involved. They're, they can go and look at it and measure it. Um, and then the final, you know, uh, the bottom part is when it gets cheap enough, now you can take the bio oil and you can make syngas. And there is a process for making steel that does not require carbon, which is the steel is similar to cement, is very carbon intensive currently, and for making ammonia. Um, and uh, you may, um, I don't know why he didn't mention it here, but um, you can also make hydrogen if it makes sense, you know, for, um, for a hydrogen based, uh, for example, if it, if it turns out that's the way that we're going to have to power airplanes. I mean, we don't really know right now. Um, so this is, um, this is kind of a market model based on price points and, uh, you know, and counting on that economy of scale to get the technology down to the required price points for wider adoption. So this is, this is again, this is uh, leveraging work that was done to support this sin fuels or sin gas industry. Um, so one of the things that they wanted to determine was, well, how much biomass is available? Is there enough to provide energy needs? And, um, and how much will that cost? Because that of course is gonna set the floor for what you could deliver sequestered carbon for. Because you're gonna have to add some cost over the cost of the biomass that goes into the process. And um, so these, these estimates um, and prices are very compatible with the, the targets. So we have good reason to think that there will be enough biomass available to hit the scale that we need and at a cost that the market can tolerate. Um, here's the, uh, the link that I mentioned before. Um, I, I started just doing some of my own sanity check, you know, back of the envelope sort of calculations. And I said, gee, I, you know, here we're thinking we could just take all the, car, the corn stove away, but what about, you know, what about the needs of the soil? Turns out there's a whole paper on exactly that. And the other thing is, so I mentioned biochar just briefly. Um, so biochar is if you, if you heat a cellulosic material in an oxygen-free environment, it, um, it doesn't burn. It reduces to, I mean, nearly pure carbon. And if you put that into the soil, it is very beneficial in terms of uh, moisture retention and also providing kind of a, a framework for the uh, um, the microbes that live in the soil. Um, so it's, uh, it's very beneficial. And so that's uh, a good thing to do with the, the, what's left after the pyrolysis besides the bio oil. Now you've got the biochar that's left and you put it in the soil and it's beneficial to the soil. So it's a nice, a nice cycle. Yeah, here, I, I think probably um, I'm gonna go a little faster because we're gonna, I'm gonna run out of time. Um, this though, I just wanted to throw this in. So this in, in course of my doing my, um, my sanity check, I ran into this thing. So <laughs> this is from Scientific American. So US corn is a highly productive crop. Okay, this is great. And I made the emphasis in red, the corn crop was mainly used for biofuels, mainly. <laughs> and then another 36% is animal feed. That's fine, right? Um, and, um, only a tiny fraction is actually used for food, and much of that is for high fructose corn syrup. Now, just in case you haven't seen it, this YouTube link is the bitter truth about sugar. And he does this wonderful job of talking about how fructose is metabolized in the liver. And if you haven't seen that, I suggest it's very informative. So now I just wanted to mention a couple of things. So when you've seen, uh, these are people who tend to focus on one aspect of what is a life cycle, you know, what is an entire process and really has to be thought of as a process. So these are all companies, so Carfix, um, so they want to capture it. Um, they dissolve CO2 in water and then inject that underground. Um, it's not very carbon dense. And global thermostat, so here's another amine-based sorbents, and then the CO2 can be resold. Um, another another chemistry to capture the CO2. So this one is interesting. I never even you know why would you even do this? But they start by um, burning um, 
methane in pure oxygen. Um, and somehow that produces less emissions and results in almost pure CO2, which is then easier to capture and then they can, they can sell it. But of course the input is still methane. Um, and now you've got um, carbon capture. So this is the people up in Canada trying to you know, make something out of the Alberta tar sands and they at least want to try to capture the carbon from that. Um, so what's missing in this sort of, you know, these, they're, they're interesting ideas, but the, none of these people talk about a full life cycle emissions analysis. So every step of the process, considering what it was, no consideration of scale, costs, no analysis of market size for CO2, so once you, you know, is there, are there any, I mean, sure, I can capture it. Does anybody want to buy it or use it? Or, you know, you, you really have to think of the whole process. And then a couple of these are continued use of fossil fuels, which we, you know, we need to stop. So, um, and so I think, I think I pretty much have mentioned everything. So let's look at, okay, so this, and I, th I think I've touched on all these things. So these are, you know, when you're going to store it, you can mineralize it, which means you can leave it on the surface. You know, you can put it underground. Um, it's in some sort of stable material. Um, underground injection. So of course, supercritical CO2 is um, liquid um, and bio oil, as we've mentioned, the term industrial. And then uh, there are, there's a, a different chemical process for making concrete that incorporates extra CO2 into the concrete and it's very stable. Yeah. Uh, John, just a quick, uh, before we get too far along, yep. uh, I got a comment that I was observed too, which is, looks like there was a typo on the previous slide where it said uh, MH4 and not CH4, presumably oh. you, you described it as methane, but presumably it was methane, right? Yes. You meant CH4? Yes. Okay, I, very good. I, I did, sorry. Um, so, Now this, 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 I mean, I'm not endorsing any of these things. This is just a, a list of every, every use that anybody mentioned. So concrete building materials, of course, that's a wonderful thing. Liquid fuels, that's a possibility. Chemicals and plastics. Um, I think you can start with the bio oil. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, no, this is starting with CO2. Um, accelerated algae growth, I mentioned that. And now it's, I've seen mentioned, you can turn it into carbon nanotubes and graphene. Somebody was talking about, you know, using carbon nanotubes instead of copper wires. I have no idea. Um, mineral steel, <clears throat> somebody said, well, you know, you, you make all this carbonated beverages. We can just take the CO2 out of the air and put it into the carbonated beverages. Um, it just seems like a bad idea <clears throat> in terms of durability. Um, and enhanced oil recovery. So once you've, you've pumped almost all of the oil out of the ground that you can get, you can pump CO2 down into the, the same well to kind of force out the remaining oil. Uh, so that's another possibility. So here's uh, carbon cure. So here's an example of uh, material. So this is a, a cement company and there's the calcification reaction there in the, in the upper right. Um, you want to end up, you start with limestone, you end up with lime and it releases CO2. And this, because we make so much cement, this amounts, uh, this accounts for 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So it, it's a huge problem. And so they have a, a new, um, a different process, which puts the CO2 into the concrete. And so they are able to talk about, you know, how much they've captured. And of course, it's nowhere near the scale that we need, but it's, uh, but it's, it's something, um, it's a start. Okay, so I'm gonna go, uh, these, so these are the, I mean, it's kind of, you know, if you just think about it very long, you figure out all these things. These are the words that they've used. Um, <clears throat> the most important one really is ending deforestation more than anything. Um, so uh, a while ago, uh, you know, the, I think it was the IPCC or the United Nations got together and said, well, we need, we need something to, you know, give people an incentive to not cut their forests down. Um, and uh, particularly in developing countries. And so there's this organization that tries to work with governments. It stands for, as you can see, the third bullet, reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. 
So, and the last bullet is why I said, really what you want to try to do is stop deforesting because deforestation causes a huge short-term change and uh, afforestation you know, takes a while because trees take a while to grow. Um, and I read recently, um, unfortunately I missed the, the reference. They said, most of the reason this hasn't worked is because the wealthy countries who committed resources to it have not honored their commitments. So um, here's a company that is, is trying to you know, make, because uh, one of the problems with, with, with forest uh, conservation is how do you measure it? If I'm a company who's invested, you know, a million dollars in, in forest, and I want to, I want some assurance that, you know, my real goal is to, to is to sequester carbon. It's not to create a forest. So, how do I translate or map, you know, forest into sequestered carbon? Um, so this company has developed software using satellite imagery that tries to do that. Um, they didn't really have much information, uh, you know, kind of explaining how accurate it was. Um, but that is, that is what they're trying to do is provide some sort of baseline so that if you invest in forest projects, um, you know, you can have some reassurance that the forest is actually there and capturing the carbon that you intended to capture. Uh, Rob, we're trying to can interrupt for a second. Yep. Uh, uh, Rob had actually had two comments. One of them I hadn't caught up yet with yet. But okay. For, uh, uh, Rob, you were talking about, uh, going back to, back to concrete, you were talking about a green Canadian concrete company. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Carlo. I think it's Robert. Okay. Oh, Let hi. Me... It's Rowena. Oh. So... oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. I, I know a Rob Lowe. I seem to who was. Sorry. Go ahead, Rowena. That's okay. So uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of Carbicrete. It's another uh, Canadian uh, company. Mm -mm. They yeah. do precast concrete without cement, which is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. It's instead steel slag, which is a waste material, mm -hmm. and uh, carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. so it's like double whammy. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to look into that. Also, Raina, you had a comment uh, just to catch up on it. I this one kind of passed, but uh, you had some uh, another comment on carbon engineering about their who owns their technology. Um, I can read it. <laughs> um, yeah, if you look at their, um, if you're interested, I can send a paper that I saw that outlined their air to fuel uh, technology, and it's. Mm. It's actually uh, Fisher Tropes and uh, nothing terribly exciting. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Let's, John, I'll let you get back on track. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Okay. No problem. So uh, you remember one of the key uh, key points of this, you're going to sequester carbon, it's got to stay there for a century, is durability. <clears throat> so uh, when you talk about forests, now you've got, and, and this is, I mentioned this earlier, that the, one of the advantages of direct air capture is it's not susceptible to climate change. That is to say the effects of climate change, because if you're talking about forests, um, which going back to my original slide from California, a whole bunch of carbon went in the air that, that summer. Um, so, and as the planet continues to warm, there will be more and more lightning. Um, so here's a map of um, wildfires around the world. And this trend, uh, trend graph in the lower right is, um, you can see, well, this, this, okay, I see now it's in the future. So it's, it's, um, it's predicted based on, you know, current trends, um, but probably, probably correct. So it makes forestry, you know, a, a heavy dependence on forestation. It, it really, you know, you have to question that because it, it's not that reliable uh, sequestration, sequestration method. Actually, and, and John, uh, one more. Uh, Andy uh, Kodak has a question about uh, the verifiability of, Reforestation. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Andy. Yes, thank you. I, I was wondering, you know, when people pay pay for these credits, mm -hmm. and and who monitors 
the the actual reforestation and and um, I it, it seems and how much has actually been credited for the reforestation effort in terms of gigatons removed? Is any statistics on that? Um, I remember if I so I don't have it in the presentation. I'm trying to remember uh, what I've seen. Um, Unfortunately, I, um, I'd be happy to, because I, I, I know I've, I've seen it in the course of my, my reading, and I'd be happy to look that up. Well, how, uh, how about just the verifiability of it? I mean, yeah, they, they're spending millions, and I guess once they feel they've paid the money, they're clean. Okay. Mm -hmm. but, that, that's, but. That's, that's one of the, the most confounding aspects of this whole thing um, is there are, I mean, too many people who are happy to take your money and not actually deliver what you think you're buying. And which is part of why that 45Q thing came into existence because the, you know, I mean, it's run by the IRS. They, they saw that, you know, there, were, there weren't enough, enough regulations on the, you know, on the process. So uh, it's, it's a real question in terms of, because the goal, of course, is to get carbon out of the air. It, it, it's not to play a shell game uh, of, you know, who's, whose fault is it, you know? Um, so uh, so the, the, the forestry and forest, um, uh, well, the incentives to stop deforestation, um, even though they're well-meaning or to reforest, um, they're not it's hard to get the scale. I mean, that was from that, that graph that I, I showed earlier, the little chart that said, you know, forestation, all of the different approaches can't, can't get us where we need to be. Um, and because so much of it was, well, the, the other thing, um, you know, I'm going to get to it later. So I, I'm going I'm to leave it until I, until I actually get to the slide. Um, this is, this is one of those, you know, when I mentioned um, tipping points and this, you know, this, this isn't supposed to be that kind of talk, but I just wanted to mention, um, that the Arctic has gone from a, a, a sink to an emitter, um, which is, you know, it's, it's a problem, obviously. Um, <clears throat> and here's an interesting, I mean, we're all, we're all talking about forests and it turns out the Northern Hemisphere's peatlands. So they store more carbon. So there, there's something if you want to, you know, kind of really focus on what has the most impact, it's preserved peatlands uh, around the world. So here's our scorecard. I think we've talked about all these things. I just want to mention this on the top of the right-hand column, additionality. So this is to say that if I buy something, it wasn't going to happen already. Right, that some <clears throat> my action increased the amount of carbon that's been sequestered beyond what would have happened even if I hadn't done anything, and this was, like, you know, in so looking back, you know, trying to audit it and determine what actually happened. Eighty-five percent of the offsets purchased are not additional; they didn't they didn't help really the situation, they didn't help move us forward. So, um, yeah. Now, this, uh, you may remember, is the lowest cost, highest impact option. Um, so I'm going to go through just, just quickly. Um, I don't know how much, uh, you know, because it's not, uh, well, regenerative agriculture. So I want to just talk about. It. So these are the principles. Um, and um, so soil health and biodiversity really are the kind of the key key to it. And so what are their practices? Somebody went crazy with their animations here. <clears throat> okay, so first thing, uh, you cannot think in terms of monocultures in regenerative agriculture, and you also um, have to, you, you, have, you can't till the soil. Uh, because doing it breaks up the whole ecosystem that's under the soil, all of the, uh, uh, you know, the, I can't think of the word, the, the, basically the parts of mushrooms that aren't their fruiting bodies. They, they, they have this whole uh, vast network that lives in the soil and the microbes um, and of course plant roots and all of that, if you turn the soil over, um, goes into the atmosphere. Well, a substantial amount of it. So 
you, um, so you need to not do that. You disrupt this whole ecosystem. I mean, and it's all about weed control. So, um, so then use of cover crops, that's again, to help the soil health, multi-species grazing, um, each, each uh, animal contributes something different in terms of, you know, what it eats and what it secretes. Um, and then uh, rotational grazing techniques, this allows um, the, uh, the, the land to recover uh, before it's grazed. Uh, which, which gives you the healthiest um, soil and the healthiest grass. Um, and <clears throat> so uh, silvopasture is where you, you include trees. So you have little forested areas, you know, work in amongst the agricultural land, um, which benefits both things. Um, only organic inputs. So, so now clearly we're trying to stop using fossil fuels to make pesticides and fertilizer and use natural cycles, natural methods, you know, um, composting, nutrient recycling and planting perennial crops. So, um, and we have um, you no know, adoption. So accelerating these, all of these things. So the um, typical, uh, monoculture farm has about 1% carbon in the soil and a regenerative farm has 3%. And if you look at all of the land used for agriculture and you simply increase from one to three, you've captured all the carbon that's been emitted since the 20th century. So the scale is just phenomenal. Um, and it, it, it's, it's just not something you can set out and just like manufacture. It's, it's not like making Jeeps for World War II or something. I mean, you have to change farming practices around the world with thousands and thousands of farmers. Um, so it, it's hard to get the speed that you need, but the scale is there and it would benefit um, just in so many ways. So here is an interesting business model. So uh, this company, Nori, um, so they, so the, one of the, and I'm sorry, this is a little out of order. So I, I just want to say, this is going to be on the scorecard slide, that why don't more farmers do this? Is it that farmers don't want to do this? Farmers actually, a lot of them view their land as like, it's been in the family for years. They love the land. They want to maintain the land. And they are unhappy about the degradation about what industrial farming has led to is they simply kind of run a process. They're not really involved with the life of the farm. Um, and what is um, now the barrier to changing is uh, crop insurance, which of course is essential because they're running on such thin margins nowadays. Crop uh, insurance dictates what pro procedures they're going to use to farm. And if they don't follow kind of industry standard industrial farming practices, they can't get crop insurance. So they can't afford to change. So one way to change that, of course, is to try to get the government regulations to change. That's a big uphill battle. Um, the other one now, this company kind of end runs that and says, well, wait a minute, maybe I can get um, essentially uh, people to support the change to regenerative agriculture by saying, you know what, I'm going to pay you to farm your land in such a way that it captures more carbon. So now the farmer has, uh, you know, a steady income stream and can better absorb the risk. And this last point is more of, a, I don't know, sort of a tech nerdy sort of thing is like, well, okay, if you start talking about parceling up, well, this acre is sequestering this much carbon, and now it wants to become part of a sequestered carbon market. How do you keep track of all of that? And somebody said, well, you know, you could use blockchains and essentially have, you know, like Bitcoins that correspond to sequestered carbon. And... I didn't, I didn't pursue that at all. I just thought it was kind of clever and novel. But it's, it's, I think it's, it's really a valid and interesting approach to, to try to provide an economic you know, like cushion for farmers um, and an alternative for people who voluntarily want to try to uh, offset their carbon. Here's another option that um, you know, should be perfectly valuable. Uh, valid, it, 
um, it does have the downside of it's an ongoing, you know, you, you, it's not like you buy it and you're done. You, it has to become an ongoing process to maintain it because as soon as, you know, the farmer sells and someone else walks in and he tills the soil and all the carbon goes in the atmosphere. Um, so it's, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mentioned it under durability. It requires continued use of proper practices. But I think that's part of what Nori uh, works out with the farmers if they want to participate. They say, well, they have to agree they're going to continue to do this. Um, and um, so, of course, there's huge, huge benefits on the benefit side, um, which is the left side. Um, the side effects of you know, reducing agricultural fertilizers and pesticides, of course, where we've got this big dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico um, due to farm runoff. Um, there's, there's right now a, an active uh, bill um, in um, Illinois because they're, they're, you know, they're trying to legally um, address this. I'd say, you know, you, we, we can't just do that. You know, we can't operate our farms such that we're killing off, you know, this whole region of the, uh, of the ocean. Um, so, of, and so the other, um, the, the justice issues, um, the biodiversity, of course, regenerative agriculture is just, I mean, it's nature again. It's not right now. If you look at a farm, it's not nature anymore. We're just using the, the soil as, a, as something to hold up plants that we're fertilizing and harvesting, but it's not nature, you know, it's not cycles that have been there. Um, and interestingly, on the plus side, it empowers the farmers to really become connected and to nurture their land again. So, as I mentioned, the, the entrenched interests, the, um, you know, regulations that are in place, um, and subsidies, uh, kind of similar, and uh, crop insurance. The, the other one that's interesting, just to mention briefly, is um, <clears throat> the food distribution system. So there was, there was a, um, a, a couple in California who, who recognized one day that they could, they could cut their leaf lettuce fresh out of the garden and put it in a bag, and it would, it would stay fresh for a while. And they said, gee, you know, maybe we should sell this. This became um, Earthbound Farms, and they when they, they, they got to a certain point and then, you know, Whole Foods wanted to carry their products and they just, they, they had to find this sort of difficult compromise between the way they wanted to grow their food and what it would take to, you know, deliver the volumes that they wanted to buy. So, um, so that, that's a separate, very interesting challenge. Um, Okay, let's just look at this quickly. I mentioned these before, so I don't think. Now, this, this is another interesting company, and I'm sure I'm almost out of time if I'm not already. Um, but I, yeah, 813. Um, so um, I, just, I just really wanted to, so here's a whole, whole different way to approach this. And then I, I think um, we'll just skip to the end. But um, so this is a, a company up in Maine. And what they thought was, well, wait a minute, you know, if we get kelp, right? And get it to grow near the surface. And then we just arrange things. So after it grows to a certain size and gets too heavy, it simply sinks to the floor of the ocean and just stays there. And it turns out that this is cheap, low impact, and it works. And so you'll see in a few minutes that they have been able to already capture, sequester a significant amount of carbon by doing this. Um, they're seeing it as a way, you know, to produce these little floats that they need. They have all these paper mills in New England that are, you know, are uh, mothballed, and they think they could fire those up and use them to make these, these uh, kelp seed things. So um, it's interesting. So the, um, the only real side effect here is we don't know what impact it'll have on the ocean by dumping gigatons of kelp on the floor. We don't know, um, but it, it, at, least, at least it's a natural material, you know? Um, so, okay, so let's see. Now, this one, 
Um, I'm going to just skip over this because this is all theoretical. It's all in the pilot study phase. But this, this again, looking at um, the enormous amounts of carbon that are sequestered in the ocean, um, you think, uh, gee, if there's some way we could hook into that. Um, but so far, so the only one that I, I've kind of followed in, in some, some detail is the idea of, of um, trying to enhance al algae growth by um, providing nutrients. And it, interestingly, in this case, the nutrient that they need is iron. Um, and so you can seed, you know, large sections of the ocean surface with iron. And sure enough, the algae goes crazy. It turns out the problem is that you don't know which of the many, many algae varieties is going to go. And um, they ended up with a huge red tide of, uh, you know, toxic algae because that one out, you know, competed all the other algae. It, it turns out that there's this wonderful balance in the ocean of all these different kinds of algae. And um, so it, it's just an example, you know, you, you, you throw some input into a very complex system and it's really hard to control, you know, the outcome you're going to get. Um, so, and let's see, so I don't think, oh, the only thing on here I want to just mention, if you look at the last bullet point, I didn't realize these numbers. So a, a single transatlantic flight produces 1.6 tons, that's a metric ton of CO2 per passenger. And a typical driver produces 2.4 over the course of a year. So air travel is just really a problem. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta figure out how we're gonna do that. Um, and here again, so now if we're, if we're talking about um, sequestered carbon as, as something that, you know, is kind of like a currency or an investment that you could, you could exchange. Um, these, are, these are kind of the, the things that are required before it could become a valid functioning market. Um, and, and people are working on all of these things but it's not there yet. So here's a firm that's simply business development. So they have uh, both um, financial people and the ecological scientists of various kinds. And so companies like Microsoft and Shopify, as they say, they, they are voluntarily coming and saying, I want to help this technology move forward. I want to invest in something. Help me decide what to invest in. And so these guys, um, provide that service. Um, it's a very interesting webinar. If you want to go look up uh, Carbon Direct and listen to these two guys, they're very, uh, very interesting. Um, this is, um, well, I got to ask you, Bob, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm over time. I feel like I should stop. Yeah, I'm a little bit, a little bit concerned about that. There's also yeah. a couple of questions hanging out that I haven't passed on because Okay. I'm going to let you get there. So, so maybe we should try and wrap it up and maybe you can, if yeah. the stuff you left out, you can come back and give us another webinar. Okay. That'd be great. Um, yeah, because, yeah. Let, yeah. So let me, let me just show you these last couple. Um, it's I, cause I, I thought it was very interesting. So who's buying this stuff? Carbon dioxide removal, the CDR. Who's buying this stuff? Shopify is the, uh, is the 800 pound gorilla. This company called Patch, Stripe, Microsoft, right? Down the road. Um, and who's selling it? So, Number one, Charm Industrial, um, Carbon Engineering. This is interesting to me because they don't have a working machine yet. And yet, look at, they've sold, they've sold a whole bunch of people on the, uh, on the promise of it. Um, Climeworks, of course, they do have a bunch of working sites and this is probably mostly sequestered. But look at the fifth one in, Running Tide. These are the, the kelp guys. Hmm. And they've already sequestered a whole bunch of... Uh, yeah, a bunch of carbon. Um, and the price. So you could go on Charm today and you could say, or, or Climeworks, you could say, I want to, you know, I want to, I want to offset my, my personal CO2 contribution, whatever it would be. You can do that today. You can go, um, obviously very different price. And you have to, now you have to do your own because there's no standardized sort of rating scheme for how durable is it? Um, what's the whole life cycle impact? What side effects does it have? Um, but again, interestingly, there's running tide right in the middle at $250. And charm is more than twice that. 
So very interesting. And now here's the bad news, right? This is, there's, the, you know, somebody decided they were going to put together this sort of, uh, like on Times Square, you know, this big, hey, how are we doing on carbon capture? So we're up to, you know, 70,000 tons, only of which 48% is delivered, but that's a tiny fraction of where we need to get. So this is still very new, this whole thing. And here are the references. So I'm, I'm going to make the slides available so you don't have to try to capture this. Um, and these are the books or re various references that I have found the most useful. Um, these two are, um, you can find them on YouTube, Just Have a Think and My Climate Journey. And they're, they're both very helpful, okay. very interesting. Very good. I've got a yeah. couple of follow-up uh, questions for you. Okay. Uh, interesting. And then we'll... Uh... Uh, wrap it up because I think it's a big, big subject, but very interesting. Lots of lots of data that you presented us. The Great. first one, uh, Shelley, if you're still here, Shelley Lowenthal asked about uh, Al Gore's promised projections. Would you like to ask it, Shelley? Or is she's trying. Yeah. You unmuted? Or he? I'm sorry. Well, here I can ask it for you. Uh, it's, has any of Al Gore's promised projections come true? Good question. Uh, that, that is a good question. And, uh, you know, I would love to. Uh, so I'm not sure which promised projections she's talking about. Although if I go over to my Al Gore presentation, there are a whole bunch of projections. But he doesn't make the projections. He quotes like IPCC. I mean, he always has references for every single slide. He says, well, where did this information come from? So I go look it up. So I guess in fairness, I would really need to know which projection she's thinking of. Okay. And uh, Raisa, uh, I have to thank you. Yeah, Lo. I hope I got your first name because they didn't write it down. Would you like to ask yours about jet fuel? Uh, yeah. Um, so there is this company called 12. It's a startup. And uh -huh. I saw that they have a way of converting CO2 into sustainable jet fuel. Have you heard anything about them? Hmm. Um, I, I did, I saw, I, it's on that list of, of um, providers um, and I didn't look into it, but I will go do that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And next is, uh, Jim has asked a question from everybody about Exxon. Uh, a mobile CSS project on the Gulf uh, and the uh, U.S. Gulf Coast. Mm -hmm. Jim, are you for round? It's um, what is your view of the Exxon Mobile C CCS project in the U.S. Gulf Coast? Do you know about it? Um, so what what I did learn recently uh, was that Exxon has started buying up defunct oil wells and. You know, there's no more oil to get to get out. So why why could they be doing that? And so we just speculated that oh, they're going to get into the sequestration business, um, and and put the put the stuff down in the wells. Um, so so far, you know, I, I certainly don't want to speak out of turn, but so far, what I've seen from uh, the fossil fuel companies is they're trying to find some way to continue their current business model. Um, and so it, it's never, it's never totally about let's stop putting carbon in the air. It's like, well, we're in the business of extracting things and moving them around. And, um, so, so I, you know, and like, like I started, in fairness, I should, I should really learn more about it before I, I say much about it, um, that specific thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, finally, uh, this one I think I can handle. Uh, Liz Carrito uh, uh, asks if she could have a link to the slides or at least references of the reading list. And <laughs> that you said, we're going to put the slides on the, on, uh, in a Dropbox and you give me the link. Yep. Now, here's why I, where I, well, I'll come in. If you've registered, if you six, there's some problems registering at the MIT site, but if you registered for this webinar at the MIT site and was successful, and that means you've got a reply, reply from MIT saying, or from me, saying this is, where you, this is where you log on and this is the link, 
then you're okay. I've got that mailing list. If you, some people have had trouble registering. If you were not unable to register, and instead of come directly using the link that we sent out later to people, understanding that they were having trouble registering, that is, if you were not successful registering and you want the link to the emails, please send me an email with your, uh, your uh, email address on it. And I'll collect those and add those to the distribution of members to make sure that whoever wants the uh, uh, copies of the slides will have that link to the Dropbox. So that if you registered, you're, you'll get the link. If you haven't registered and you're going direct with the link that we sent out to people, send me an email. I'll collect your uh, email addresses and add it to the distribution. Uh, so with that, this is running a little bit later than, than normal, although not really that bad. We usually <laughs> run about an hour, 15 minutes, in those cases, maybe 10, 10 minutes more than that. But I want to thank you very much. Uh, lots and lots of information. And uh, also, I want to thank everybody for participating because I'm always amazed at, uh, at, at the group that we've had here, you know, the group mostly MIT, but other people as well, who are really up on, uh, uh, on climate change and climate change issues and what we can do about them. And uh, uh, it makes me happy to know that uh, there, there are people so involved. We'll somehow hopefully get other people involved and get this thing uh, resolved successfully, I hope. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot. I'm noticing a lot of the emails say that they've, a lot of the chats saying they've learned a lot as well too. So thank you very much. And Great. Um, well, that will close it down. So okay. Thanks good. everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you for yep. speaking. Yep. Good night, everybody.